this next segment now, I will now retreat to being the, the moderator to ask our expert panel a variety of different questions. The first question, and one that I'm sure we're all very keen to get back to, um, and this one is for Sean. What are the future potential of events like BIP, and what are they missing in order to remain useful in the new normal? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, as we all know, the pandemic shut down face-to-face -face meetings and travel and everything. And, and for a lot of the business uh, in the industry, that was like turning off a water nozzle, right? And, and everything halted. And, and people had to learn how to kind of figure out ways to get distribution and, and everything moving again. And it reminds me of something Steve Jobs said during his first stint with, with Apple. And he said that the internet is the ultimate distribution method. And he was absolutely right. And so, you know, this industry as a, as a whole, uh, you know, a lot of it is still in kind of that old world before the internet dominated as the way of distribution. And so uh, a lot of these models of getting together face to face, et cetera, they're gonna have to adapt. They're gonna have to evolve and, and change just like everyone has had to do in the past year, working from home or doing other things that have prevented some of the, the traditional ways of connecting and, and discovering what's out there and building these relationships. We need to use the internet because that is the tool that we're using from like a flex perspective, but everyone is moved to, and that's how the, the consumers and the viewers are trying to find content as well. So these shows, I you know, I don't think they're going away by any stretch. However, they're going to have to evolve to accommodate uh, this kind of global view of, of everything, as you talked about that, you know, content is becoming more globalized. Uh, we're a global company. Everyone is trying to break down certain barriers and bring this content to everybody. So whether or not it's the, you know, uh, what used to be perceived as content only that could be in America or only in an English country, English content works well everywhere. Subtitles are being broken down. People are watching content that, you know, <laughs> range across any type of taste, mood, or guilty pleasure, nostalgia, any type of reason. So from our standpoint and connecting, you know, who has the content to the people who can distribute the content, uh, you know, that is going to have to evolve a little bit better and, and work together a little bit better. And hopefully that's where those shows are going to help us out with that. Do you think that um, the industry is looking forward to getting back and having a beer with each other though? <laughs> I think definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that there's not the place for the, the, the face to face. Right. And, and I think we're all dying to kind of get together and have a beer together or, or, you know, just get together if nothing else. But, you know, think about the, the shows in general. So, you know, we're based in the U S if we're trying to find content for Europe, uh, we got to find the right show, uh, go to intend something in Europe, try to find who those people are, uh, which can be very difficult. And, you know, everything is compressed into this time where you're not going to be able to accomplish everything that you need to because everything is face to face. Right. So I think a lot more is going to be centered around you know, trying to find more visibility with every, with both sides and, and trying to connect those. Uh, but the shows themselves being more probably focused than what they've been traditionally, where I think a lot of us go to the show and we may attend something here and there. And for the most part, we just have all of our meetings scheduled, right? And, and we're booked all day long, uh, you know, going from meeting to meeting with uh, the people we're either already partnered with or people we're looking to partner with. And so that aspect, you know, getting together is great. But again, these shows, the, the big value that the reason why any of us want to go is to help foster and promote more business, right? And to get content out there and, and streaming. And so until, you know, with the shutdown and stuff, that affected a lot of people. And I think uh, that as, uh, you know, the MIPS of the world uh, are going to have to respond uh, to figure out ways to get us back because people have adjusted. The Internet is starting to scale things now where we can make these connections, even though there's, you know, it's still uh, has a long way to go. 
And, uh, you know, I think these types of events are going to be more uh, geared towards, you know, probably education trends uh, and then very specific kind of networking and, and different aspects along those lines that um, maybe are a little more focused than what they've been in the past. Yeah, thanks. I mean, if I can just jump in there, I, I agree with you, Sean. I think, you know, everyone like, likes to meet up. Mm -hmm. And there is the, you know, if you're talking about co-pro deals, if you're talking about strategic uh, partnerships, then, you know, it's hard to beat face to face and, and to mm -hmm. do that in person. But I think so. And also, if you're going there to attend a seminar or a workshop or a presentation about something that's new, um, then, uh, you know, that's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think the transactional part of going building a booth, sitting in the booth, taking meetings on a 20-minute kind of cycle to try and get deals done sitting in a booth, I think that's going to fade away. I think yeah. they're going to become much more uh, focused not on the, the deal-making activity but on everything else around it. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Yeah. Right. It's, as you said, it's, it's hard it's hard to do discovery when you've got, what is it, 15,000 people, uh, say, attend, um, mm -hmm. and how to get around them, you know, in three days. Right. Whereas if you've got an online property and you're looking for content, um, you can do that much easier. And remember, not everyone can afford to get to MIP, both on the buy side and the sell side. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Something we'll be addressing and discussing as well. We, I just saw uh, today the BBC Studios just pulled out, saying they can net, not going to be attending MIP this year. It was announced on TBI. Oh, so you know, if if more m more of the big names pull out, I think it may could make it quite questionable. Great, thank you very much for your responses. There, I think um, next question is for Thomas. How is it possible to source, negotiate, and acquire content that engages an audience with an increasingly globalized taste? You had to give the tough question to me. I did. <laughs> First of all, thanks everybody for coming to the seminar. I see some familiar names in the in the side over here, and that's always fun. I, I like what Sean alluded to in this this notion that we have unlimited shelf space, essentially. It's not like a Walmart DVD shelf where there is very limited real estate to put a title, but in the internet world, in the digital world, essentially unlimited shelf space. But what we have to remember is content is art. And imagine that if you had you know, the biggest art gallery in the world that was as big as a warehouse and your customers had to walk in and sort through that warehouse to find the exact art that they like. It's the age old problem of presenting the right content. But to your question, Ben, finding the right content, I think the secret is thinking globally, acting locally. Not my phrase. I didn't coin it, but it's certainly apropos here. Local preferences, they, I can tell you from experience in, in my years at Lionsgate that Preferences differ in the U.S. We all know that. I mean, a, a film could perform differently in the Northeast than it might in the Southeast or in the um, uh, uh, in the Upper West Coast in Seattle. And the same is true all over the globe. In India and Italy, for example, viewing tends to skew more towards movies. In other markets like the U.K., viewing tends towards series. I think the answer is you can't march in not going to pick on any platform, but if you're a U.S. based platform and Sean can nod or shake either way, if you can't march into a, a, a territory outside the U.S. and think that only U.S. fare is going to satisfy the viewing habits of those customers that you want to attract, you have to have not only local content, but content from all over the globe. Now, at the risk of sounding incredibly salesy, I would be remiss if I did not mention Vueler as a wonderful place to source content. But um, seriously, I, I mean, you, you alluded to this, Sean, when you were talking about going to events. It's hard. Your time is limited. The Internet is, is the answer to finding and sourcing that content 
and doing a deal more quickly than you can flying halfway around the globe. Hey, thank you very much, Thomas. Okay, next question. This one's for Simon. How is content buying becoming increasingly data-driven in today's market? Well, I, I think that buying is no different to being a consumer and finding content. With the explosion that we've all talked about in terms of how many new shows are out there, and even with the slight sort of decline that we saw or the, the reserve on that growth through the pandemic year of 2020, um, data is going to be the absolute way that drives discovery for both the consumer and, and for sort of the, the business user. Um, from our perspective, our core business has historically been on discovery of content for users. So we power most of the major sort of user paradigms for content discovery, um, and we power the recommendations engines. And so we, you know, historically have grown the breadth of our data, and more and more as the amount of content has increased, we have to grow the depth of our data to be able to get more granular to identify shows to help consumers and recommendations engines find relevant stuff. That exact same data set is really powerful for helping people who want to buy content to put on their platforms um, or people who are selling content and want to find white space or to find sort of people that are being successful with that type of content available. So if you take something even like, you know, a major movie like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, who historically or what that it historically would have been, it would have been an action drama, it would have been a, a, a comedy drama of that ilk, you know, now we are talking about it in terms of mood being offbeat and confident. You know, it's a, about changing times and intersecting lives. It's about fame and friendship. Um, it's about doubt in personal issues. It takes place in Los Angeles. All of those data points are things that then allow you to drive discovery and find similar shows, similar content on whichever end of the, the cycle, the, the purchase cycle or the consumption cycle that you are about about you know to find relevant shows that are good for you um so we're really excited and we think that you know this data-driven experience together with uh, the legacy sort of camaraderie that exists in this industry is going to be really important and are you finding the um services that are out there trying to connect you know consumer discovery with the content you must have a range of apps that are approaching you for those data sets right now yeah we we I mean, our data is used to power most of the discovery experiences out there. Um, our database, we have about 25 million shows in the database. Um, we, on a regular basis, are providing information on 60,000 TV channels around the world, about 200 of the top um, streaming libraries um, in 85 countries and 35 languages. So that's a very broad base of the landscape of content that's available. And then obviously, because we've been doing this for a period of time, you've got all of the historic data to be able to start to look at it and benchmark what's working in one country versus another country and, and build out those analytics and insight tools that you need to be able to do some of the decisioning that is going to be ever more important going forward. When we discussed in the warm-up call, Simon, one of the things I, I found particularly interesting was the discussion around how buyers are, can use your data sets to figure out what's missing within a market who's holding what and see track the the history or the progression of a title um are they are they accessing that data through a tool that's provided by grace note or are they literally manipulating those feeds themselves it it's it's both um okay. so there are sort of tools that we have so you can understand what is available where stuff is shown um, when it's been available and what windows it works on um, and other people um, that are have their own data science teams just consume an API of the all of the data that we have and build their own analytics um, you know so for instance you know if you if there is a specific show that you're looking at we can tell you where it's been broadcast what channels it's been broadcast on in which countries and which streaming services it's been on and in which windows it's been available and at what price Sounds like a very useful tool for also tracking down if if your if your rights are being respected uh, by the board. Absolutely, I mean, there's a great anecdote we have of 
um, somebody in the sports world that owned a, a franchise and had licensed it to one of the big broadcasters in the US and was in the regional airport, you know, grabbing a beer before his flight home, saw his content on a TV channel, didn't recognize the TV channel, and was able to say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Can you tell me everywhere that my content is shown? And found out that this large broadcaster had sub-licensed his content to some regional networks, and he was able to go back and renegotiate and, and make more money. Yeah, that's great data. Great data. Uh, just before we leave the topic of data, um, the other aspect of the data that the acquisition team will have available them today if they're working for one of the VOD platforms is their own internal data. And if you think about that compared to someone who'd been maybe buying for free to wear or, or cable TV, where you know there may have been audience data uh, from a panel, but today a buyer would be sitting down having a review meeting with their internal data sciences people who will be reporting on who's been watching what, how the catalog's performing, what titles, what genres, where, and then using that internally sourced data to match up with um, the data that science has been talking about to then make decisions as to what to go out to look for. Um, that, that, that integration of first-party data and third-party data uh, is where things can get really interesting. To, to be able to predict that. Then then the question is, uh, how do you look for the content, right? You, you know you need this type of content. Where do you go to find it, right? It, um, often, you know, what I hear is that the buyer sits down and the acquisition team sits down, send an email out to some of the distributors they used to, they, they're used to working with, but they'll also go hit Google and they'll start searching around for filmmakers or distributors or production houses um, to try and find interesting new sources of content that maybe is fresh and interesting and new. Uh, and in often cases, those those guys don't may not have distribution into the US or into the market that you're in. So, you know, how do you cross those hurdles? Um, pulling that all together is really interesting if we can pull that together into one venue where that data is available and you know, the catalogs from thousands and thousands of sellers have been aggregated into one place and that and giving you a easy to use set of search tools across all of the harmonized metadata across those. I think that's what we're really striving to, to, to build and bring to market to make it easy for, for acquisitions people to, to go through that whole buying journey. Yeah, if I, if I looked at Product Hunt, one of the interesting things I was doing when I was researching this was just typing in film recommendations apps and you know there was just a plethora of ones there and obviously the discovery problem is hitting both sides of the market with the buyers but also the consumers very interesting um we're going to move on to the next question now um what's the future of content deals are we going to see the market shift increasingly towards performance in the future and if not what might be blocking this progression? This is a question for both Ian and Sean. Sean, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, the answer is absolutely yes. That's it's moving towards performance, and and, and it, some of this is the the shift in thinking and kind of some of that old world, new world a little bit uh, as well. You know, for the longest time. People have been able to say, all right, the only way I'm going to get my content out there was basically, I, you know, have this cable channel and put it on cable TV and here's everything that's known and we know the audience. I'm going to know my predictability of how, many, how much money I can make, so on and so forth. In today's OTT world, like I wish I could predict things as well as they could in 1988 uh, with uh, the cable world, but simply can't. And the reality is, is that you know, what we're really doing more than anything else is creating, developing, and then monetizing completely new markets and audiences, right? So there's the audience that's familiar with a ton of the, you know, content that's out there that's been subscribing to everything, so on and so forth. And it's been a long time cable customer now uses, you know, subscribes to six apps or seven apps. These people are becoming rarer and rarer. And 
versus the huge pool of potential out there. And so the types of deals that are, are moving forward are much more based on, you know, revenue sharing and, and concepts and, and licensing terms that are, that are based on, all right, if we can get this out there, we find this audience, so on and so forth, how can we share in, in both the, the upside and the, and the revenue and also kind of protect you know some of the uh, the pitfalls that that may exist, but it's very much going out there and taking uh, content that is in many cases brand new to an audience. Uh, in other cases, maybe the audience is familiar with it, but they've seen it before or didn't have interest or doesn't hit their taste. Finding all those things takes time, money, marketing, <laughs> uh, a lot of things that go on. And so kind of sharing that risk and these new models of we can share on all the upside, but this guaranteed known of the old way of kind of licensing something is disappearing more and more. And, and I think that's good for both sides of, of this uh, from a seller or buyer perspective, uh, because it allows then from like my perspective, to be able to experiment with content, to go out and try to find content that's that's maybe not uh, on the mainstream, that's underserved. Maybe it's niche. Maybe it's something else. You know, we we've seen all sorts of incredible things happen with, uh, like, for example, the Mandalorian streaming when it was uh, going on with Disney. We found the entire Western genre all of a sudden uplifted. People were streaming westerns at a crazy rate. And we're doing it all over the world. And so uh, we wouldn't have been able to go out and license all that great Westerns, uh, you know, in anticipation of something like that. Uh, but where we're basing the deal on, you know, performance and, and upside in this future aspect, we can go ahead and get that and be prepared for when the market is ready to be able to capitalize on it. So those combination of reasons is why you know, the answer is yes, and it's moving there very, very fast. And it, and sometimes it can be a little difficult because, you know, these are new concepts for a lot of people. Uh, but this is how we tap into all that, you know, massive audience everywhere that uh, hasn't been exposed to this and is just waiting to be exposed. If I can pick up on a few points there, I think it's uh, a big part of the future. Uh, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it'll take over and completely dominate, uh, but I think it'll be a big part of the future. Um, what we see on our platform is that we, we support all the key pricing models. So it's the, you know, price, some people like to buy on a per viewer basis. Some people like to buy on a per minute streamed basis. And if you're ad funded, then it's on a rev share on advertising revenue. So, you know, those are the, the three key models. Obviously, if it's uh, TVOD and EST, it's on a transaction basis. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, in, in reality, TVOD and EST has always been performance based. So we, we never really called it that before, but uh, it always has been. Um, and as you say, Sean, what it does allow is for a platform to be more adventurous with their buying. If uh, you know, the, the, the content performs well, then everybody's happy. If it doesn't perform well, then you know, the, uh, the content probably wasn't worth what, what uh, a flat fee might have otherwise been demanded for it. Um, and in the end, that simply you know, creates a bad taste. Um, so I think performance will be a, a critical, critical part of the industry to go forward and it will reward good content that pulls an audience um and uh it, but it does require trust between buyer and seller mm -hmm. around the reporting um and you know some negotiation and trust around how a title is going to be supported and promoted mm -hmm. so you know all of those things come into come into play because if i'm a seller i don't really want to provide my content you know, on a purely performance basis and have it stuck in the back corner of the app to never be seen. Um, so I think all of those, but that also, you know, that isn't in the best interest of the, of the streaming platform either. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's that, but the key difference is that today 
when someone consumes a piece of co content, they're logged in and they're authenticated. So we know who they are, we know where they are, we know what time of day, we know how, you know, how much of that content they've, they've, uh, they've watched. And therefore you can use those performance KPIs to create a value, to find a value for a piece of content rather than simply say, oh, this content, I've got to license it to you because the production budget was X. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and, and adding to this, I think it's important to note also is, you know, it's very much the wild, wild west these days when it comes to content. Like it is coming from everywhere in mass quantities. And so uh, when you have just such an amazing, I, the spectrum of content is huge uh, and you're dealing with taste and moods and all these things of an audience that can also be very, very different. You know, everyone's going to have you know, certain audiences that, you know, uh, that they're stronger in when it comes to certain types of genres, things along these lines. But performance-based, the, the, the thing about having, you know, these types of deals made is, is it does allow for content that, you know, maybe isn't that huge theatrical release or, you know, that older blockbuster with all the A-list celebrities, things along those lines. You know, the problem Ian was describing is, you know, one of us is going to have to be on the risk here. Either I, I have to, you know, get and pay for something and take the gamble that it's going to work and, and get a return or we share the risk. Right. And I think that's why you're seeing this new approach come more and more is because there's so much content out there and, and users are, you know, audiences are going and, and getting whatever kind of content interests them all over the place. So. It becomes hard to find content, where content is, can I get it right now, can I get it where I am, so on and so forth, that being able to have a big enough kind of catalog for people to stream and be able to keep their attention and be able to go down any particular rabbit hole that they want to go in or engage however they want to, you know, no service is going to be able to do the traditional model of paying for all that content up front and taking on all that risk, right? because not every piece of content is going to have the same level of successes. And so, uh, you know, the, the great thing about, you know, sharing in the risk and doing revenue share deals and these types of aspects that are more based on, um, you know, performance is that you can get really data driven and the stuff that's working, you can start bubbling that up across the board and the stuff that's not, you're, you're not on the hook for. I don't have to force it on the user now to be successful if they don't want to watch it, I can recommend that content to somebody else that is going to like it, which improves the entire experience. Right. And that's a big piece of this. We often forget when we're in the, the throes of licensing and partnership discussions and everything else that at the end of the day, it's the person sitting at home, clicking on their TV, deciding all of our futures in this. And so having that as part of the perspective, we have to remember that, the more we can make these deals towards finding those people and not, you know, forcing content on them because that's where the money went. Uh, we can build audiences, we can develop these audiences and then we can monetize them and they can be much more lucrative financially for, you know, down the road for these companies. Yeah. Another thing that we say, we see going hand in hand in that is uh, historically that you know uh, a seller has done maybe fewer deals at a much higher value and on an exclusive basis um but today what we're seeing is that as audiences are fragmenting across many 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 more platforms that they can go to and choose for their entertainment audiences are declining per platform um at sellers now are doing lower value deals but across um, many more platforms on a non-exclusive basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some, some tentpole products will be bought on an exclusive basis and you'll build your marketing and the acquisition around that. But for the rest, you don't need to pay for exclusivity. Um, so we see, in fact, uh, a, a very vibrant market now. Um, more, you know, more content being made, more content being bought than ever before, more money in the industry than ever before. It's just the structure of the deals today are different from 
how they were being done five, ten years ago. Quick question back to you both. Um, are there any territories or countries within, within the world where performance deals are looked on quite favorably and which countries are still more emphasis on the whole, on the whole approach with minimum guarantees? I mean, from my perspective, I think the U.S. is typically the tip of the spear when it comes to most of this. And that's where I see people are more willing to, you know, sit down and try to figure out these things first. But we're starting to see it around the globe. But it's been slower internationally than it has been in the U.S., um, but it's getting there. Some of it also is, is you know, uh, the thing we haven't talked about, which is all the legacy deals that a lot of times these people are tied to, right? And, and uh, MFNs and everything else that it just complicates. And so there's also this aspect that a new way, a new model frees themselves from a lot of the bonds that were held on them from deals that were signed 20 years ago or something, right? Like there, it's happening. And, and as I said before, the evolution here of the past year of uh, with lockdown and everything like that, I think it's kind of ripped the bandaid off a lot. And, and people are starting to have to think outside the box and start thinking about how can I get my content in the right hands and in the right areas and in front of the right audiences. And, and that's, both harder than what it used to be and a lot easier now. The internet's made it easy, but you got to embrace it all the way, right? And and at the same time, you know, it means some rethinking here and there on some of the models. Well, we've seen how things like Friends uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and The Office have been tremendous audience uh, growers for, for companies like Netflix. But all those old catalogs of TV shows from the 60s and 70s, essentially, mm -hmm waking up a new audience to that uh that's right to that content but there's no demand for it so you must be in some very interesting negotiations sometimes to explain to someone who's been sitting on a catalog for 20 years how, how do you broach that conversation with them how, how how does the conversation go well it starts with a little storytelling about where the market is i think more than anything else right it's you know, it's a perfect example. You can get a TV show, uh, like real conversation from not too long ago, uh, several months ago. It's trying to get the the TV series Kung Fu, right? And and trying to get that for markets outside the US and to appease people like me that, you know, the 13 year old me really wants to watch Kung Fu again. And so I know that there's a big market out there for it and an audience for it somewhere right but i'm gonna have to you know find through curation and recommendations and marketing and data analytics and looking at where can i find these audiences present it where am i getting traffic and and things along these lines which again lends itself to i need the deal to to allow for me to go monetize and define those audiences and develop them right and and that risk if i'm stuck to an old model of I got to pay for that. Well, on an episode basis, even an old show like that can get to a point where that now between it and the marketing and everything else, it's not worth my time. I'm not going to get that back, but we could potentially get back a huge amount that's still monetizing this thing that literally is collecting dust in, in somebody's storage. Right? So it's, it's, I think it's easy when people start seeing how simple it is for the user and start thinking about it from the user perspective and, and what they're wanting to do. And and once you kind of come at it from that perspective, I, I think the rest starts making a lot more sense on, on the business. But inherently, it there's always the, the question of, well, what can I predict? What, when, when can I expect X or Y? And, and those that's the type of information that you know, is harder to discover. And, and once you know it, then you're able with that data to, to go out and capitalize it and take it to the next level. Right. But um, a lot of audience development, Ben. It, it, it's interesting because actually, you know, if you take, I mean, Grace Note was acquired by Nielsen, which has mm -hmm. certainly from the US market, huge amounts of audience and demographic information about who is watching or who has watched what. Um, you know, the next evolution is absolutely the that predictive side of things. So you've got the underlying here, are, here is here is the content, either that exists today or you know even 
content I would like to make with this set of attributes, if I placed it in on this channel, in this streaming service, what is that audience likely to look like mm -hmm. from a ethnicity makeup as and demographics as well as, you know, from a sheer size. So I, I think those are some of the interesting challenges that we're, you know, from a data perspective, we're looking to address over the course of the next couple of years. Because again, that's, you know, adding value to everybody in the chain to be able to make their decisioning with a bit more than gut feel. I was watching some of the conversation um, on the on the chat. Uh, it, it's interesting. The uh, if you think about it from an, uh, a structural and economics point of view, if you if you're making a film and it has these characteristics, you know, maybe it's a comedy science fiction, then um, you know, I, I grew up in the UK in the days when we had a choice of four TV channels, right? BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and Channel Four. Um, and if I was making that film, I could go, I could sell it to one of those channels. And there was a population of 60 million people. Um, and, you know, there would be a good chance that it got a big enough audience that that would have been a reasonable deal to make in those days. But today, everyone in the UK and everywhere else has not just hundreds, but thousands of destinations that they can go to to consume content. So the number of people that are going to want to watch a romantic, uh, or, you know, a, a comedy, should we say, a comedy science fiction on any one channel is going to be very much smaller. So the seller is going to get a much higher marginal return by selling that piece of content non-exclusively to many platforms so that the content has to find the audience. We are well past, although you know, I think some people in the industry don't, don't really get it, we're well past the idea that the audience will come to the content. Today, the content has to go to the audience. If your audience is over there, then there's no point selling it to this platform and expecting them to be able to pull the audience from the other app to come and watch it, right? Unless you have truly, you know, really remarkable content of which, you know, the top half a percent might do that. But the rest of the content in, in the industry is not going to pull an app, pull a person from one app to the other. So you need to recognize that and instead put your content where the audience is. And that is well, across I, I, the million. Yeah, and I, I think you know there are data points because of what's now available that you can help provide pointers. Oh, yeah. So if it is the comedy science fiction, you can say, where else is that type of content available with similar attributes? Mm. You know, what services are over-indexing in this type of content? And then if you've got the audience data, you can say, are they being successful or not? So. I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I think right through the value chain from what to make, what to buy, what to sell, where to sell it, and then, you know, from a from a consumer perspective, you know, what can I find that's relevant for me? All of those are questions that, you know, data driven sort of insights can can help, you know, and hopefully we can be part of that to get together with you guys. Yeah, that'd be yeah. exciting. And, and not to make it more complex, but there's also new delivery methods now too, right? So content, you know, that maybe once was very stale or static in a particular area can find new mediums now. And so like fast channels that you had in your presentation have completely, I mean, that is exploding in growth because that kind of guided EPG style is a lean back experience and, and content there can be more easily discovered than on an on demand basis and things of these, uh, you know, kind of come into play. Like in the SVOD or AVOD world, any type on demand, the cover art is going to mean a tremendous amount as to whether or not someone selects it. You know, who's in it? Do they know the title, the artwork, how pretty? I mean, there's all sorts of visual aspects that go into it beyond just what the show actually is. In, in a lean back experience, it's the exact opposite. People are much less invested on the brand of what the channel is or the, the cover art or any of that piece of it. It's more about subject matter and, and what kind of mood they're in. Are they in a mood just to click on something to 
mind numbingly watch, you know, Bigfoot or are they interested in the news at that particular time or whatever the case may be. So content has also become very much a holistic aspect. The way I look at it is that when you get it, finding these audiences also means that we may need to find where that content is best suited from a discovery perspective and an engagement. Yeah. The Interesting. I, I've, I've lost count of the amount of times that I've been working on a, on a film for a, for a movie launch or a TV launch to be de delivered assets that are just not persuading the audience at all. And yeah. it's so off people's radar. It, uh, it can really let down a campaign. Yeah. I think that's, the I think maybe you know a, a general statement is that this industry has not been used to having to market individual products, individual titles, in in the same way that you know someone selling something on Amazon is used to having a great pack shot, a good description, the right keywords, you know, all of the things that drive the the you know the 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 action. Um, and mainly because it's come from a linear basis, right? Where you know you you you'd sit there, you turn it on, and it would be served up for you, so that you didn't have to have a user-driven discovery process. But I think for all those people who you know talk about how long it takes them flipping around on Netflix or one of those till they find something that they want to watch, I think we've forgotten sitting on the armchair with the remote channel surfing flipping 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 to find a channel that was showing something that you were interested in at the time that you were sitting down to watch and you know the the cable box here in singapore will throw up three four hundred channels and you'll just have to flick through and flick through um and in many cases you know mo many of them are on genres or areas that you're not interested in um and then you come back and go, well, I'm really only find myself watching one, you know, one of between three, five, ten channels, perhaps at most. And right now, there's nothing on. Yeah, yeah that, well, I, I think that is the that's the next step of certainly consumer discovery. I mean, yeah. at the moment, it's all focused on recommendations to narrow down and just give you more of what you've already consumed. Um, mm. There is still a, you know, and that's very much a lean back experience. I mean, with the data that we have now, you can you can build a, a very um, engaging lean forward experience that starts off with a, hey, I'm in the mood to be scared or I'm in the mood to laugh or I'm in the mood to yeah. just feel good. And you can drive a discovery experience from that sort of data as well. I mean, it's uh, yeah. something else that we're looking at. I think that's interesting because you can see Spotify doing that. If you look on one of their discovery journeys, right, mm -hmm. you know, I, Monday morning, rainy Monday morning music, right, or, you That's know, right. I, mood lifting, I, energizing music or studying music. Um, I think there are, or there are some lessons to be learned from the music industry around this discovery aspect yeah. too. Absolutely. We're better than that. We shall move on to the next question because I am conscious that we have lots of very interesting questions from the audience. <laughs> uh, so keep sending them through. We will be getting to them in the last 15, 20 minutes of this presentation. Uh, you'll have your chance to hear the wise words of the panel. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. What are the technologies and services that help with the process of discovery to find and locate new content? This is for buyers, not uh, audiences, by the way. Um, this question is for uh, Sean and Simon. Yeah, shall I, I kick it off? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the tools are going to be very similar to what people are used to in the consumer discovery side of things. Um, it's data-driven. There are going to be visualization tools. There are going to be analytics tools. There are going to be benchmarking tools. Um, if you look at how you can now describe a piece of content in very great detail, almost to give it you know, some DNA or a fingerprint, as opposed to just categorize it as an action movie, a rom-com, a comedy, a, a sci-fi movie. Um, you can get very granular and you can drive tremendous um, discovery across the whole sort of content data set, um, the catalog. Um, and that is something that is not just for buyers, it's, you know, as I said earlier, it's for the creative development teams to know what to make, how to make it, who to cast in it. 
um, because of the diversity and inclusion aspects that are coming into a lot of uh, creation, content creation now. Um, but also, as you know, the buyer and seller markets, there are going to be tools that help both sides. How do you package stuff up into, you know, three or four things that can fit with a particular target market? Or, you know, I'm looking for a set of attributes that fit my catalog, my broadcast channel, my audience and my demographic and go out and within the, the database find, find stuff that fits that. So I think from both sides of the coin, you're going to get a lot more um, insightful data points uh, to, to be able to make decisions. Yeah, I, I think the the data is getting richer more. It's we're in the era of big data, right? So it, it's yeah. there's so much that you can do. I think from a big picture perspective, though, there are certain challenges, right? And and um, an industry where for decades has been fragmented, and you know there there are like five different people that do every middleman thing that you can imagine in this industry, right? Finding what in the world is available is really, really tough just from a big picture perspective. So if I'm looking for a particular genre or a particular actor for a particular geo or a particular language, like every time I add something to the qualifier basically means it's going to be next to impossible for me to find blindly from where I'm at, right? Like th this is one of the big issues I think from just the distribution side of things on my side of the table is how can we react to the data and be able to go out and acquire the content that the data is telling us to go get. It becomes very difficult because quite honestly, you're left with a Google search like you do everything, you know, and, and you end up with trying to find crazy searches and everything else. And there are these, you know, uh, companies that will sit in between and help in certain aspects. But again, you're only seeing slices of things. I think that's where, you know, there's a huge opportunity. I think that's where, you know, Thomas and, and what they're working on is, is trying to accomplish a lot of, right? Is is how then can I take this data and make it actionable? And and given that so many in the, the content producer side of the world, you know, are still evolving with the internet, still not quite there, you know, don't exactly have this great web presence that I can just do a Google search and there it is and it's in my top five and there's not this universal site that tells me everything about content everywhere in the world and, and how I can get my hands on it, who I need to talk to, all these types of things become just barriers that it takes a little bit uh, more time. So what ends up happening a lot of the, the time is the, the relationships and the partnerships that you do have and, and you end up mining their catalogs a lot more trying to find these things and then going out you know, externally and, and doing your best. But at some point, we just need to connect these dots probably a little bit better. And, and you know, from the, the type of stuff that uh, Simon's working on to the point where my curator needs to go and look for something very specific for a very specific market and audience, um, you know, there's a disconnect. We're working yeah, I mean, on it. We're working yeah, on I mean, it. You're working I, I, on it. Yeah, I think all of us are. I mean, all of us on the on the panel are, are looking to how we can effectively level the playing field and mm -hmm. give everybody, you know, a, a common set of information to to add their own um, experience and gut feel to to make the right decisions. I mean, yeah, that, that's the goal for everybody here. Yeah, I think that's what's exciting is that these tools. You know, a couple of years ago it was, ooh, it was really tough, and now it's getting easier and easier and easier. Um, you know, it's not all the way there yet, but certainly I think as we get closer to where both sides can find these areas where, um, you know, hey, I'm over here and hey, great, I, I know where you are and we can get, you know, somehow connected. It goes back to that MIP conversation, Ben, right? Like, how do we get these connections between the people who have the content that may be what I'm exactly looking for and where the data is saying that we should go get? How do, how do we make those connections and know, you know, what the windows are, what's available, what what types of things? Because there is a lot of content out there that is exclusive, a lot of stuff that's locked up for long periods of time. There's stuff that, 
you know, exchanges hands on who the licensor is and, and, you know, moves over to this aggregator who sells the catalog over there. And then of course, you know, I think we all realize all the merger and acquisition activity that's been going on that just amplifies it all. So now all of a sudden catalogs are moving companies and the people that we were dealing with no longer there. So how do we continue to, to try to find, uh, content and connect these, you know, bridge that gap between what the user wants and what the data is telling us and how we find that. I think there are three key ingredients if we're going to find the solution. The, the first is a business model ingredient. The second is a technology ingredient. Mm -hmm. And the third is the data ingredient. So, uh, John, you're just talking about some of the data point about avails and who's got the uh, the distribution rights for titles. Um, so all of those data points and then the data points that Sean was talking about in terms of audience preferences and, uh, and the metadata that goes around it. So, really, you know, the first uh, one third of the problem is about bringing all of that data into, um, one place and connecting the dots between them so that a title uh, that the title is describing the metadata and the title and you know, on the platform is the same thing. So that's not a, that's a non-trivial exercise. Mm -hmm. The tech really is about providing a discovery journey, a user interface and supporting what the buyer needs to do. Um, and then the business model aspect of it is to make it uh, a very easy on ramp for someone who's a seller of content. You know, if they have to pay to list their content, then, you know, that's going to put up barriers. But a business model where you can list your content, your entire content, without having to pay any money up front, and it's on a platform that has some good tech, and it has increasing amount of the data that you need available to it, it's going to start to, to support that process. But you need all three of those ingredients on there because you need to get to scale for it to become interesting. Great. Very interesting answers there. So um, I'm conscious that we are entering the final phase of this discussion and to give our wonderful audience a chance to ask their questions. I'm going to just quickly summarize and, f and fire off one more question to the whole panel and then we'll move into the question times. So it seems that we are facing a, fu a future where speed and agility rule. Consumers' tastes change. If you don't have what they want, they'll churn. So it's all about discovering content quickly and acquiring content to match that changing taste over time. Except the tool sets that we're used to using are all over the place at the moment. We have increasing complexity in deal structures. Digital deliveries are changing. The devices we're using are producing more opportunities for uh, screen content. Rights management is a massive issue as we find that paper contracts are no, no longer able to, to deal with the volume. Geography is no longer an issue in our, in our business dealings. And performance uh, deals are, are becoming more of an industry norm, hopefully over the future, particularly for the resurrection of great old shows. I think we really des um, should think about, you know, a little bit of a brainstorm here uh, in this final question, I think we should go out to the whole panel. What would the ideal buying journey look like uh, for the future of acquiring content? And I'll put that out to the whole panel now. Starting with you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think they're really just a I guess a continuation of what I was saying in my last point, which is, you know, a platform that's aggregating the titles from all around the world, giving you powerful tools to navigate that catalog and to have the data that you need so that you can identify, first of all, the content that you think is interesting, then to have the data that proves that it's going to work well for your audience, and then the data that allows you know you to easily construct an offer and press a button and for the offer to be presented to the right person you don't even have to find out who the right person is 
maybe the platform does that for you. You submit your offer, say, I would like to acquire it, these rights, these times, these territories. And the platform routes that offer to the right person who can then respond to, to you. Um, I think, you know, that that's that's kind of the vision that, that would make life easy. Throw it open to, to other others. No, I think that's, I mean, that's getting closer to the nirvana, right? I mean, um, having kind of that aggregation is the key. I, I, I think from my perspective, it, you have to have two things, right? You have to have uh, a lot of content there. So that way, whatever it is that I, you know, may be looking for, I can find it, right? Even if it's something that's not available, letting me know that, okay, it is there. It just, you know, it's not available or, or whatever the case may be. It's not in the right window. Perhaps it's not available for that particular type of license. Right. Um, and then obviously, you know, needing that kind of back and forth. We had talked about, you know, the getting together to have a beer is never going to go away. Well, the same thing is, you know, getting together and having a conversation about some things is never going to go away too. So there's always these aspects that it's like an 80, 20 rule where if, if things can automate your, your work to, you know, 80% so that the stuff that you don't want to spend a lot of time on, you doesn't require a lot of churn. You can just go out and acquire and or sell whichever side of the equation you're on. And then for follow-ups, you know, there's that one particular title. You say it's not available there. When is it? And getting to being able to connect the two to see about what the future may hold for that particular title or potentially just discuss other alternative models. Some of these things are going to, you know, happen really, really fast for people. And it's going to really improve kind of a lot of the uh, the red tape that exists uh, between it. And, and that's where I think the kind of the last piece of it is, is that, you know, the terms and, and you know, going through the windows, all these things can be quite laborious depending on legal departments. And so I think that's the next phase is once... Once you get to where we are, where Ian described, then it's how can we facilitate that, and make that a lot faster on the stuff that, you know, normally we uh, takes weeks to try to drone out. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I mean, what you say about aggregation of data is um, certainly from our aspect because we're not involved in that sort of. Once you've got the data set, how do you then conclude the deal? Um, making sure that everybody is uh, forewarned and forearmed with all of the data set, or all, all of the data that they need to make an informed, have an informed discussion um, and do it in one place so that you're not trying to manipulate 20 different sources of information and you make all of the judgment calls on how you merge them together and does data set A equal data set B? Do they, are they talking about the same thing? Do we try and clarify all of that so that we take the pain out of the process. I mean, that, that for me is, you know, the goal of, you know, my day job. Yep. I would just add this and every, every buyer that I have ever known personally, like I've gotten to know Sean better preparing for this is a content geek like Sean. When you talked about Kung Fu and I'm, you know, you and I are close in age. And so I remember that show, every buyer that I've ever known that's a successful buyer has a passion for content. They may not have a deep rooted passion for all of it, but they have a passion for it in general. And they acknowledge that it's incredibly hard to make good commercially viable content. And as the only studio guy sitting here and I get reminded from my colleagues across the industry, but inside Bueller and out, um, I, I just have such a healthy respect for how difficult it is to make good content. Audiences are fickle. They will surprise you. You will make something that you may think as a, as a content creator is not going to do as well as it, as it ends up doing. And of course the inverse is true. But one of my favorite examples from Lionsgate, and I'll leave you with this was I was in the room when um, Eric Feig pitched La La Land to you know, senior executives in the company. And if you looked around this long table, conference table at Lionsgate, you just saw these puzzled faces, like how are we gonna make 
a musical modern day about Los Angeles. And whether you love it or hate it, I, I love it, by the way. It is a piece of, you know, moving making magic um, for which the content creators deserve all the credit. But it's hard to make it and, and uh, it's hard to find it and buy it. But we want to help make that journey easier. Great. Thank you very much for the input. Fascinating panel. I think um, just for the audience to be aware, we will be launching a site uh, dedicated to this webinar where we'll be uploading all the materials and the presentation that we put together. There will be a huge appendix in there that you'll be able to take away and look into. Um, I wish we had longer and I wish we had more uh, time for the attention, but uh, such is life. Anyway, the download site will be ready in the next uh, day or two after this event and we'll be mailing everyone now. What I'd like to just move into in this final uh, time that we have left is the questions from the audience. Uh, my colleagues have been managing the panel in the background and dropping polls on you guys that you've been answering, uh, have selected a few questions to go through. So this one is from um, Timothy Hjested, who sounds Danish. Um, what kind of new revenue sharing models are you seeing that was the question. <laughs> uh, so maybe I jump in. The, the, these are the uh, performance models that um, we've we've got built out. Um, and when we were doing the research to to figure out what what the industry needs and how they work, we found that it was really based on either a payment based on a per viewer uh, or payment based on per minute streamed or payment based on a percentage share of ad revenue generated around that piece of content. So those three are the kind of main metrics that drive the performance. And all of those, you know, can either be with a minimum guarantee or, you know, between buyer and seller, they can negotiate to do those deals without a minimum guarantee. So that's, that's an overlay onto that. So those are the, uh, those are the key variables that our people are using to drive that price negotiation. Thank you very much, Ian. All right, next question is from, and I'm, I hope I don't murder this name, uh, it's Nyeka and Yina Ulasi. I noticed everyone is talking about Western content, and I was wondering if African content has a market for monetization in the Western market, because I noticed that Western platforms are not open to acquiring. I'm a distributor from Af for African content, and it just it's just a major challenge for us as a company. Yeah, I mean, this, I think jumping in here, this is one of the problems of trying to find content and, and the people who are distributing it, too. Um, so we actually just are onboarding our first African content for the U.S., and it's not because we've chosen to sit on the sidelines and not do it. It's how in the world do we find somebody, given that, I haven't been a traditional audience, you know, as Thomas said, I'm a huge fan of, of entertainment. I watch a lot of movies and TV, but I can't watch it all. And, I, and I'm never going to be exposed because of all the complexities with windows and licensing and distribution to everything that's out there. Right. And so some of it is becoming aware and discovery and these types of things of how do we find it. Um, but that's one of the big aspects I think that we have found is that, you know, uh, as a global company, content, it works virtually everywhere. People have moved around the world there. You know, we find actually, uh, funny enough, there's more Bollywood content streamed outside of India than inside of India and inside of India, more English content that, you know, is streamed on our platform. You know, little oddities like this that, you know, I think that's where, from a platform perspective, it, it's important trying to find it all and bring it in so that we can go out and seek those markets. But it's that connection. Cool. Next question is. Oh, oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, we, um, I just actually checked um, on on the Vula catalog. We've, we've got nearly 30,000 titles, about 170,000 hours. And actually, we have a fairly good representation of African content there, and we're quite excited to the kind of to be getting plugged into the Nollywood kind of Nigerian content production industry, and we think that's really exciting. Yeah, I'd also recommend companies like Simon's. With you know, we use TMS IDs probably like everyone in the world, and so. <laughs> 
you know, getting in and knowing the metadata, the metadata is a big piece of this and, and getting, you know, uh, that component is, is important too, to, to helping scale the business and making you a little more visible out there. So your recommendation, Sean, would be that if you're an African producer to learn the metadata formats that Simon's company. It, it, and, it helps. And, yeah. and reach out to someone with Todd and uh, Tom and get it out there on it too, right? Like you, it's gotta be an all in strategy. You're gonna have to look at this and, and you know, look at what are the tools that can get my content in front of the right people and what are the, uh, the types of things that are gonna present my content in the right way. We talked about the difficulties in choosing content and based on taste and moods and how much on an on-demand world, for example, the cover art means. All these things really come into play and in understanding where it all is. And, and because from our perspective, you know, from a distribution, you know, I have to lean on the experts here, you know, in their areas. And so I it, get connected to as many of the, you know, these components as possible across metadata, your data itself, uh, you know, a system that connects to buyers and sellers, so on and so forth. And don't be afraid to obviously reach out to. Yeah, I, I would absolutely second that. And, you know, we don't want to be a roadblock in stopping content coming in and being discoverable. Um, right. And we're building some tools that will make it easier to get hold of a, an ID so that it that actually happens and metadata can flow. So, yeah, happy to have any conversations with anybody that's interested in how to do that. Uh, and Simon, is, can people go to the uh, Grace Note site and, and look at the packs in terms of, is, is there an information resource? Maybe we could uh, stick that in there. Well. Yeah, we can certainly give you the information there on how to reach out and sort of talk to somebody that's responsible for your particular area of the globe and, and start to get involved. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. Next question is from uh, Ralph Tobias. Canada and the UK do a good job of selling to the US, but it seems uh, getting like getting shows from other countries into the US market is difficult. Please discuss. Licensing. <laughs> you know it's it's this is my my daily grind right is um they're, they're basically the habit of most of hollywood is well let's just do everything here in the u.s because the u.s is the home of everything so we got to start here right and then it, it you've got to work to go international but for whatever reason you know the the bigger the studio, the more likely it is they just want to start in the U.S. Even Canada is like, so let's do that next after that. And then remember that the way a lot of companies are organized, um, unfortunately, in, in these old models where every country that I need to, you know, want to take a particular title and go to, I mean, need to talk to a completely different department that is in that country. So to get to the UK, for example, I have to get introduced by people who don't know who those people are to then go to them and then have the entire conversation all over again and find things. It, it's a hard process. And that's why, you know, using technology and the tools to reduce not only that time, but also all those friction and pain points uh, becomes more and more important. And I think that's going to help with the rollout internationally of uh, premium con content. Um, question from Moranu Raluca. Do the sellers find the right market to sell its products, whether it's a catalog or a title release or a new title release? I don't think I got that question quite right. Do the sellers find the right market to sell its products, whether it's a catalog title or a new release? Perhaps I can interpret that a little bit. Um, I think... I think the question might be asking, you know, is, is it a seller driven process where the seller goes around, does all the research and goes to, to present in a very specific way? Or is it a buyer driven process where the buyer, you know, observes some of the trends, looks at some of the data from uh, Simon and his organization, some of the other things and goes, I need now to find this and then goes out to find that content. Um, and the answer, of course, it needs to be a little bit of both. But I think increasingly uh, it, it needs to be a, a buyer initiated process because 
you know, it doesn't really matter what you're selling in what category, in which industry. If you're a seller, it's almost impossible to know which buyer is ready to buy your product and when. So if you're trying to sell, especially if you're doing it in a, in a narrow bandwidth way, sales calls, Zoom calls, one-to-one, -one, the chance of you making the call to the right buyer at the right time when they're ready to buy what you've got actually is quite, quite hard work. Whereas if you put your content in a place where when the buyer wants that thing, they go, they search, they find your content, they then send you an offer. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're moving more from a architecture where it is sold one-to-one, -one, narrow bandwidth, to an architecture where it's done through marketing and, um, you know, digital platforms to a discovery and negotiation and acquisition. And if you can streamline the process, deals on, on Vula these days close in about 10 days. So you can streamline that whole process, make it much easier for the seller and the buyer to interact. Is there a, a service within Vula where buyers can put up what they're looking for so sellers can actually start to get an insight into what's available? Or is there any website that, that does that kind of service? Uh, soon will be. <laughs> Patent pending. Very good. Patent pending. Watch the space. <laughs> But um, what we do have is a, is a, a team we call them Marketplace Success Managers. Um, if, if you're a buyer and you have a brief, we're more than happy to take that brief. And because we know the sellers and we know the catalog and we know the technology, we can help source and curate that and present back, you know, a curated set for you to be able to review from. So, you know, we, we, can, we can manually process that for you until we have the technology um, live to do that on your behalf all right i'm gonna have put one final question out there uh this one comes from greg dorchak this may have been answered before when i logged in but will the information for the filmmaker ever be more made more visible and maybe geared towards them making a better financial gain i.e amazon netflix not only have confusing and misleading payout systems but the filmmakers make literal pennies well, I, I know some of the, um, the Netflix deals that have been for a um, very, very large number of pennies. Um, and I think that's because, you know, they are buying a, a, a vast set of rights. So, they, you know, they will buy out all the different VOD rights and they'll buy rights for 100 to 120 different countries in one deal. And although the price, when you look at many of those deals, the price per country actually is relatively low because you can do a single deal across 100 plus countries the total deal size is you know obviously very attractive um so i think you know those those deals are there and we see we see them getting done we, we hear about them get, being done um if you've got finished content and you know despite what what you see when you, you start watching a piece of uh, Netflix content and it comes up as a Netflix original, um, a number of the analyst tools actually point out that 95% of Netflix's catalog is bought content, not commissioned by, by count. So, you know, if, you're, if you've got finished content and it's attractive and you can get in front of Netflix and it's what they want, then, you know, you have a, a, an interesting opportunity. If you're doing that, make sure you retain the rights that Netflix is not monetizing. So if they're, you know, that don't, don't bundle in free-to-air, for instance, don't bundle in the rights for geographies where Netflix doesn't have a footprint because you can retain those rights you can list them on Vula and we can monetize those rights that Netflix haven't taken. So we do have a quite a large catalog of what our branded Netflix original listed for licensing on the Vula platform. Thank you very much, Ian. And thank you very much, Simon, Sean, Toss and Ian. Wonderful panel, real uh, joy to listen to. I think we had a bunch of other questions. And I think what we'll try and do is um, we'll put the questions around the panel just to answer so they'll be available as an appendix in the website. Like I said, a lot was put in there. We'll have the poll information as well. 
an extended download with a rich appendix of um, the slides that we didn't include in the show, plus some more details, and this video edited uh, with all the ums and ahs taken out of it as well. Thank you very much for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. I know everyone has a tremendously busy schedule as we come out of the lockdown, but it was great to hear the insights. And we have a fantastically interesting problem to solve over the next 10 years. You know, there's a billion dollar company waiting there to be made with this, uh, with this, uh, with this issue.